Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and across Europe, and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the seventh discussion in our virtual series, State to State, German-American State Legislator Dialogue. I know I speak for my colleagues here at the ACG when I say that we're very, very happy to continue this collaboration with the Aspen Institute Germany. The State to State series provides a platform for very important subnational exchanges and in-depth discussions among German and American state legislators and a broader audience on common issues affecting the transatlantic community. Both of our organizations have recognized the increasing role of subnational actors such as states, communities, and cities in addressing issues and believe it's critical to engage decision makers and opinion leaders at the state and local level. Both ACG and Aspen have also been working on projects in the field of agricultural policy, resource scarcity, and food security. For nearly 40 years, the ACG has actually organized exchanges between farmers, ranchers, and policy experts to look at various facets of agriculture. And as a matter of fact, one of our guests today just returned from a week-long trip to Germany to meet with policymakers and practitioners to discuss best practices in farming, as well as German, European, and U.S. agricultural policy. I, for one, am very much looking forward to today's discussion, and we're very excited that you could, you could join us today. I'm delighted now to turn things over to Stormy Miltner, the director of the Aspen Institute Germany, who will moderate today's discussion. But before I do, Stormy, a big thanks to you and to your colleagues at Aspen for working with us to make this possible. So with that, Stormy, over to you. Well, Steve, um, thank you so much. Uh, the pleasure is always on our side. Um, and thank you so much to, to you and your colleagues um, for cooperating um, on this uh, very important um, initiative. Um, as Steve said, um, we've been working, on, both of our organizations have been working on agriculture issues uh, for quite a while. Um, and we are just starting a new initiative at the Espen Institute in Germany, which is uh, the Future Forum Agriculture, where we want to bring farmers together to talk about future issues um, in, in a structured way. So for both of our organizations, um, we are transatlantic. Um, we look at the federal level, we look at the state level, and we look at the sub-state level to deal with the big, big um, challenges um, of today. And today, we want to talk um, about agriculture and food security. And um, as we all know, that is a topic of huge importance um, to our economies, um, to our societies, for the environment and our planet. Agriculture can contribute massively to protecting um, natural resources, to preserving biodiversity, mitigating climate change, and also obviously ensuring global food security. Um, and it also plays and can play a very positive role in social cohesion and rural development. But on the other side, the agricultural sector, and that's also what we all know, is facing huge challenges um, uh, because of climate change, um, because of water shortage, um, because of uh, more severe weather patterns, but also because people are leaving rural areas to move to more urban areas, um, because of a lack of young people being interested to work in the agricultural sector. Um, so there are huge, huge domestic um, challenges which both sides of the Atlantic um, are facing, maybe in different degrees, um, but uh, they appear very, sim very similar. And um, recently, new challenges um, have added to this, um, especially Russia's war on Ukraine, um, the geopolitical frictions um, in the world, disruption of disruptions of supply chains um, for important inputs for the agricultural sector, protectionism, um, export controls. So while this is an area of huge potential, it is also an area of, I would say, huge challenges. 
And um, this is what we want to discuss today with uh, representatives um, from both sides um, of the Atlantic. Before I um, introduce our um, four speakers um, and, and panelists, um, I also would like to remind um, our audience, although Steve had already said so in the beginning, I still want to do it again, um, how you can contribute and participate in our dialogue. Um, you can, throughout the whole process, you can write questions and comments in our Q&A um, and uh, in, in the function. And um, I will then read that out um, and bring it in into the discussion. But we will also have a section in our um, in our event today when you can raise your electronic hand. Um, you, you by now now all know where to find it um, and raise your electronic hand. And then I will call on you. Um, we cannot call on you visually, but we can call on you um, via audio. Um, so jump in and tell us what you think, what you wor are worried about. About and also about um, solutions. So let me introduce um, our panelists um, of today and a big, big thank you to all of them because they have a very busy schedule, um, legislative schedule, um, and they freed up the time to be here um, today. So thank you very much. On the German side, let me welcome El 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 Elrit uh, Pasbrick, um, who is a member of the Social Democratic Party in the State Parliament of Saxony-Anhalt. And um, she is a deputy chairwoman of the Committee for Agriculture, Food uh, and Food and Forestry, and spokesperson for agriculture, animal welfare, and petitions for the SPD parliamentary group. And um, if, if we did our research correctly, um, I found out that she was raised on a farm in a uh, rural and a rural area. And um, bringing in um, her interest in agriculture already uh, from, from a very young age, um, and it has followed you throughout uh, your whole career. So um, thank you so much, Eldred, for being here today. It is also a great uh, pleasure from the other side of the uh, Atlantic, from the United States, to welcome Representative Sidney Carlin from Kansas, who is a Democrat in the Kansas House of Representatives. And she is a ranking minor minority member of both the Kansas House Committee on Agriculture and the House Committee on Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, Budget. And we are also joined um, by Senator Russ Goodman, Goodman, I'm sorry, who is a member <laughs> of the Republican Party in the Georgia State um, Senate. Um, and he serves as uh, the secretary um, for the Senate Committee on Agriculture and Consumer Affairs and um, is a seventh generation South Georgia farmer. Um, and entrepreneur um, and um, with a big, big passion, as I read and heard, for agriculture and rural, um, rural Georgia. So welcome to both of you. Um, it's wonderful um, to have you. And last but not least, let me also welcome our third U.S. state legislator, um, Assemblywoman uh, Donna Lupado, um, who is a Democrat um, in the New York State Assembly. Um, she is a chair of the Assembly Committee on Agriculture and serves on the National Conference um, of State Legislatures Agricultural Task Force. And we want to know all about what that is um, and if that is something um, which we also have something similar we have in Germany or we should have. So thank you so much um, to all of you for being here um, today. What I would like to kick us off with is a question to all four of you. Um, if you have to do, had to do a ranking of the biggest challenges um, for the agricultural sector and for rural areas, what would be the most two important, the, the two biggest challenges um, in that field? Um, and I would love to um, start uh, with Donna, if I may. Well, uh, thanks again for having us. It's a, certainly a pleasure to be here, and I'm looking forward to having this type of dialogue and and building relationships going forward. Uh, you pretty much outlined a gamut of, of issues that we're dealing with. It's difficult to, to narrow in on, on a couple, but in, in New York State, labor is probably our, our biggest issue. Uh, we have labor shortages uh, due to a variety of factors. The uh, agricultural work is difficult. It's not really attractive to, to a lot of people. Uh, we have um, a failure, uh, an enormous failure at the federal level for 
in my opinion, for immigration reform. That would make this a, a lot easier uh, for us. Uh, New York State has also put in place some wage mandates, which is putting uh, pressure on our on our farmers. Uh, I, again, the federal level, we're working with uh, you know wage laws uh, regarding agricultural workers that haven't been changed in decades. Uh, so we've got you know pressures on on our farmers from purely a, a labor standpoint, to getting the work done. Um, and I would say our other major issue, of course, is is climate. It is so completely unpredictable uh, out there. Early rains, uh, frosts that we're not expecting, uh, it, droughts. It's, you know, in upstate New York, you know, we had a, a fairly stable uh, climate and now uh, that has really been, been tossed. Uh, we're spending a lot of effort right now on uh, hardening and climate resiliency uh, to assist our farmers. Uh, but as, as our conversation proceeds, I'm, I'm certain that, you know, we'll have opportunity to talk about the silver lining that came along with the pandemic, uh, which has highlighted the importance of, of, our, of our farming community and the agricultural economy in general. Uh, certainly our colleagues in New York City are, are far more tuned in uh, to the value of, uh, and the, and the uh, vulnerability of, of our farmers and, and the work they do. So um, I'll look forward to going on about that a little further. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Donna, for kicking us off. Um, and um, I, I noted I noted the labor issues, which we will definitely come back to. Um, and I would love to hear a little bit more later on um, what you meant when you said wages and wage laws. Um, and I'm sure you can explain that a little bit more. Let's uh, jump onto the other side of the um, Atlantic. Um, Elrit, are, um, did, did, did it resonate with you what we just heard? Or are, uh, do you have other challenges in mind? Um, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a good possibility to get uh, into uh, exchange with you. Um, and uh, for us, it's the same as uh, Donna just said, that the top challenge for us is uh, climate change. Uh, and indeed, since years, uh, we have much too hot summers and we don't have any rain here. So we have to adapt to this new situation. Um, but uh, we will, uh, when our discussion goes on, we will uh, step into it uh, more deeply, I guess. And um, the second challenge I would outline here is um, that our farmers have to adjust uh, to the political restrictions uh, that we have from the common agricultural policy. Um, for example, uh, the required reduction of uh, using fertilizers. Uh, maybe you have uh, experiences with that, but this is uh, uh, the second big problem we have here. Mm. Thank you so much for also reminding us um, that uh, on our side of the Atlantic, it's more like a multi-level game, huh? I mean, we also have the European level in there, which sets regulation standards. Um, Mm. Makes it not, not always easier, um, but we will come back to that um, as well in, in a second. Um, Wes, what would you say? Um, what are the biggest challenges? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I just got back from Germany about a week ago, and I can't thank the German people enough and the American Council on Germany. It was, it was uh, you know, it really broadened my horizons. And I will tell you that farmers are the same everywhere. Uh, you know, the accents or languages may be different, but I think that uh, farmers share a, a, a lot of uh, common similarities. Um, I grew up growing peanuts, cotton, and tobacco. Uh, my family's been farming in South Georgia for about 200 years. I now grow blueberries and pecans and uh, pine trees. Um, I would say this, I, blueberries in the part of Georgia that I represent is uh, close to a billion dollar industry now. And so, um, for us and for, for the farmers in my area, uh, trade is a very big issue um, because the American government, you know, we, uh, we, we set regulations and standards um, in terms of environmental standards, uh, mission standards, labor standards, and everything else that we expect our farmers to grow their products under. Um, but yet we're, we're, not, uh, we're not doing a very good job of protecting our farmers uh, from trade with countries that do not grow their products under the same set of standards. And so that's been an issue for us. You know, in 2010, uh, Mexico um, shipped in 1.8 million pounds of blueberries in the United States. And last year, I think it was something like 63 million pounds. And so 
Uh, th that's an issue. Another issue is the ever decreasing um, farmer share of the American food dollar. Um, consolidation in the ag sector is a huge issue. Every industry that the farmer buys from and every industry that the farmer sells to is consolidated. And that's that, that's uh, played a part, I think, in the farmer's ever decreasing share of the American food dollar. Um, so I would say that I would say uh, long term, uh, the farmers ever increasing, uh, I'm sorry, every decreasing uh, share of the American food dollar and trade in our part of the world. Um, obviously, uh, climate change is, is, is playing an issue as well. One of the things that I learned in Germany when we met with uh, the crop insurance folks that we met with that I think you all do a better job of than we do in terms of crop insurance. Uh, normally, um, we will have a frost event about once out of every 10 years. Um, and in the last seven years, we've had three frost events. And so in, in Germany, you all insure whatever the value of that crop is. But in the United States, the farmer's working on a seven year average of what his yields are. And so those three years that we had freezes decreases our base. And so um, I think you all do a lot uh, a better job in terms of, of that than we do. And that's one of the things that I think we need to be working on in the United States is as has these frost events happened with more regularity uh, that we need to uh, maybe follow suit with what uh, our friends in Germany are doing in terms of crop insurance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Wes. Um, I noted down all these issues and we come back to them as well. Um, I have a very important question though to ask you in between. Is it pecan pie or is it pecan pie? <laughs> Well, what the farmers in, in Georgia will tell you is that if if uh, if they're cheap, they're pecans, and if they're bringing a high price, they're pecans. Ah, good point. <laughs> and over to you, Sydney. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges? Um, we have really struggled with water issues, <clears throat> and it's political as well as uh, actual water needs. Uh, we were, all of our water supplies from Colorado and Nebraska have been affected by the droughts and the lack of snow in Colorado. Western Kansas depends a lot on Colorado River. Um, so we've had a lot of water issues and we've had a, for every year we have water conferences and we come up with good ideas, but we cannot get past the uh, legislature. Um, we can't get uh, past the lobbyist. Uh, and farmers, I understand, and I, I was raised on a very small farm, but we didn't have irrigation, nor did we need it. But irrigation issues, um, we have a <clears throat> first in first in line, first, uh, you get the most water if you've been there the longest, whatever, is first in time, first in right, or something, um, policy. And we're trying to modify that, and we have had some success by forming uh, what we call LIMAs, um, which is organizations of the community um, to offer themselves to a contract with each other that they can use what they need and share uh, and bank uh, water usage. That is um, helping, but um, and we're starting to do things like restore into our aquifer, um, actually push the water back in when we have uh, water uh, to put in through um, cleaning up water and putting it back in. Uh, it's a process that I know little about that just heard it at the last conference. And uh, that's as much as I can really say right now about it. <clears throat> the other thing, our farmers are having a difficult time with fertilizer production. It's um, not available. It's very costly. I have 80 acres and, you know, I don't farm it, but I pay the bills and um, the cost has gone up, but it's just hard. Statewide, we're concerned about the availability of fertilizers. Of course, we have climate issues. Uh, we've had a lot of range fires in the last few years. We've lost uh, thousands. One one fire, we lost seven thousand head of cattle, um, which was huge. And then we had a big heat wave this summer. We lost two thousand head of cattle in a feedlot that uh, the temperature just got too high, uh, too fast, and 
they had they were standing on a concrete bed and uh, they had come from another climate uh, into Kansas and it was they reacted by dying. So we've had uh, some losses that were just heat related, fire related, climate related. Um, it's a pretty conservative state. Um, most of the time I'm, I'm um, not getting anywhere with trying to solve climate issues. It's uh, we're climate deniers, uh, which is very sad, although we are working on it. Thank you very, very much, um, and uh, also sharing these um, these these really terrible examples. Um, all of you identified climate issues as one big, big issue. Um, we also heard about labor issues. Um, we heard about trade issues. Um, also, availability of fertilizer. Maybe we stay a little bit with the climate issue. Um, and we know that um, it's not just raising temperatures, but it's also the severe weather events, it's fires, it's heat, it's unpredictability, it's, um, uh, Donna mentioned early, early um, uh, cold temperatures, um, and um, and I think Russ, you also mentioned um, that, that that can be a problem. Um, what what are state legislatures legislatures doing about this? Um, are there regulations coming up? Are there laws coming up? Um, how are you trying to help um, farmers to get to to adjust? Um, and I would love to um, to start with uh, El El Elrit uh, this time. Um, what are we doing on our side of the Atlantic? First of all, we um, we have to change our water law. You know, in the moment um, we uh, we have to let our water flow away completely um, in cases of floods and of, of rains and snow. Um, uh, in the last years, it has been that we in winter and spring we had a lot of snow and a lot of rain. So actually, there would have been a lot of water that we could have we tend, but we, we were not allowed to. We had to just let it flow away and it was not available for our farmers when they needed it. So now we change our water law so that uh, in future it will be possible to retain water and to use it when it is needed. Um, we are quite optimistic about it, that it uh, would uh, change our situation um, uh, for our farmers and uh, another support we have to give uh, would be to install drip irrigation. Um, there's a lot of, uh, um, we are just looking around uh, during Europe and uh, having a look at Spain and France because there it is, uh, 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 the drip irrigation uh, is applied and uh, so we need to know more about it, uh, how to apply it and then uh, of course uh, uh, we should uh, fund it uh, so that it's uh, getting uh, into practice uh, here in Saxony Anhalt. Thank you so much. Um, so water, water seems to be a big issue um, everywhere, um, and um, it, it doesn't come automatically. Um, how to use it in 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 a, in a good way? And um, Sydney, you also mentioned water rights um, and. Uh, those who are upstream, downstream, who have the oldest water rights. That seems to be a big problem in your state as well. Yes, it is. Um, with the, well, of course, like I talked about the, the rivers coming in from other states, other states have maybe blocked, we've had lawsuits, blocked, uh, the water taken, given us gray water instead of real water. And, you know, so we've had some issues over the years with that. Uh, we do use drip irrigation and we do have, uh, that is being used here. Um, we've also done, I'm, I'm sorry, Stormy, I'm not sure if I'm on, on your question, but um, we also are doing a lot of uh, mitigating the soil uh, through um, planting crops that uh, we leave in the ground to deteriorate. I don't know what we call it. Somebody knows. But uh, beets, um, tur uh, turnips, those kind of crops that uh, enrich and hold the, so the moisture in the soil. So we've got some things going there. Uh, but uh, just trying to encourage people 
to use less water in their farming is, is really important because the communities that depend on that water for people to live are, are um, often threatened. I mean, in the United States, you know, you look at Phoenix and uh, the South, the big, the big uh, population centers that depend on the water. Uh, I know in California, the, um, I have a house out there that um, is threatened by fire every year in the mountains. And then also the snow is not coming in like it has been. And so we, we're not sending water downstream to uh, Reno, Nevada and places. So it is climate change and uh, we're not doing enough. I wish I were a better expert on it. I am not because I have not felt. We did restrict coal, um, coal plants because of the um, air quality. Um, we didn't allow one to be built about 10 years ago and it was quite a battle. Uh, we are using nuclear energy and we're looking uh, at uh, a lot of wind. We have a lot of wind and we're building a lot more wind and encouraging solar. So those things are, I know, going to help us. Um, I think that's, I, did I answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, also bringing in those, um, the, those cases and what you're doing, um, th th that's perfect. Um, bringing in the, the uh, soil quality, um, talking about drip irrigation and also moisture capturing um, in, in, in the ground. Um, Russ, uh, my, my blueberry plants all died this year because they didn't get any water um, or not enough water. Um, how are you... Um, in your state, um, how are you regulating water usage um, and what are you doing about um, uh, uh, supporting farmers to enhance soil quality and, and uh, moisture capture in the soil? Well, on our farm, we use drip irrigation for, uh, for both fertigation and for irrigation. Um, and, you know, I, I apologize. I, I sort of, I come at this from a little bit different point of view, um, but, uh, you know, I would I would hope that you would want me to, um, I guess, for better understandings, I guess, to, to understand how farmers in, in my part of the world feel about it. Um, I, I'm not a climate denier, um, but we, we all live on the same planet. And um, when I was speaking with German farmers, they, I think, uh, sort of felt the same way about this, where today you have... Um, 1.8% of the population is farming and 98.2% are not farming. And so I think that creates a, a disconnect. Um, but for instance, let me put it this way. Um, we're in the timber business. Uh, the tractor that we've been planting trees with for 40 years, um, we cannot buy it in this country anymore. But they still build that country 10 miles across the border in Mexico and ship it all over the world. And it's a tier three engine and we have to have tier four engines. And so for frost protection, the, 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 we now have to buy tier four engines for frost protection. Well, we only use those engines about 10 nights a year when we're, as you say, in, uh, in Germany, sprinkling uh, for frost protection. Um, but yet those engines are under the same emission standards as a semi that's putting 200,000 miles a year on the interstate. Um, and so I think in terms of how farmers in my part of the country feel, water is not a huge issue because we're close to Oak Oak Swamp. We, we have been in ongoing litigation between Tennessee and Florida with uh, water wars over there. We have a uh, moratorium in southwest Georgia on putting in new wells. Um, but we've also, in terms of, you know, we're putting in a lot of solar in Georgia, and that's created a lot of concern too, because uh, you know I know in Southwest Georgia there's been eight thousand acres of farmland that's been converted to solar. Um, but I think in my part of the world, um, one of the biggest concerns with farmers is that, um, and and honestly, this is this is my my opinion as well is if we if we truly um, care about the environment and we want to put these regulations on American farmers. Why are we, why are we um, not protecting them from countries who are not? Because there's a huge cost involved with that, right? There's a huge cost involved with just labor 
and I was talking with German farmers and they, they deal with some of the thing, same, same deals in, in terms of where you get a lot of your fruits and vegetables from. Um, and so uh, fertilizer is a huge issue. I've been really sounding the alarm on that. Uh, I believe it's 67.11% of the world's ammonium nitrate comes from Russia. Uh, one of the things we found out as well throughout this pandemic is the same, a lot of the same companies that make our medicines are now based in China. Uh, and those same companies are also in the plant protection product industry. Um, and, uh, you know, if we didn't have plant protection products, um, our yields would probably be 25% of what they are today. And so, and, and, and my perspective, and, and certainly I know, you know, I very much respect everyone's different perspective about things. Um, but in terms for farmers in Georgia, um, I don't know how, you know, how we can say we're going to, uh, to me, I, I just don't see if we are going to require farmers and, and we, we recognize that climate change is an issue, um, but yet we're going to make those same farmers who are growing things under the regulations that our country puts on them, we're going to make them have to compete on a level playing field with countries that are not doing that. Because at the end of the day, when we talk about food security, I think that's going to end up exporting our, our agricultural uh, uh, industry to countries that, uh, that, that don't follow those same set of guidelines. That's my perspective. Um, I always tell people that I tell them what I believe to be the truth, but I recognize that people have different ideas about what the truth is. <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's kind of my perspective. No, thank you so much. And I want to come back to the trade issue in a second and um, also talk about um, subsidies and tariffs and um, what you would say would, would be a good mix or is not a good mix. But uh, I also wanted to bring in Donna um, and to ask you um, what your state legislature is doing with regard to agriculture and climate change. Well, uh, New York State has very aggressive climate goals. And uh, we're very sensitive to not putting mandates on to the point Senator just made, not mandating our farmers uh, go in one particular direction. Uh, we have um, recently, I passed a, a bill called the Soil Health and Climate Resiliency Act, uh, which stands up a lot of resources we're making available to our farmers who would like to learn more about um, ways to uh, protect their soil uh, through reducing tillage and cover crops and Soil crop rotation and that sort of thing. Uh, Cornell University, which is one of the major land grant universities and top one of the top schools in the world, uh, has uh, committed themselves to educating our farmers, those who would like to get involved. And we find that um, you know, farmers are very open to it and interested in so long as we can help them stand up some of these uh, you know some of these changes that they need to make we, we certainly can't require them to do it and then not provide them the, the adequate resources uh, i must say that there is a tension growing between our aggressive climate goals and um, land pressures um, i'm very worried about protecting prime farmland uh, from solar development for example uh, and I'm interested in, you know, pursuing a policy where we can, you know, hopefully make some determinations to where we're, we're going to place these, uh, these, um, you know, these developments for our clean energy standards. We, we have some, some sort of tension developing here. Uh, we support farmers' rights, of course, to do with their land as they wish. Uh, it's just that uh, due to pressures from labor and all the rest of it, it's becoming unsustainable for them to farm. So we're, we're stuck in a bit of a catch-22 here at the moment. Aggressive climate goals, helping our farmers, uh, you know, improve their sustainability. But at the same time, some of them are, are saying, hey, you know, you need our land to meet your other goals for clean energy. So it's, it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it, it, there are certainly some some trade offs and things which are hard to reconcile. Um, and um, Elrid, is that also an issue in Germany that there are conflicting interests with regard to renewable energy production um, and farmland usage? Uh, oh yes, there is there is, uh, but uh, we have a, a, a commitment that we say agricultural land should be agriculturally. Um, uh, engaged, you know. First of all, we want to produce food on our agricultural land, and we have, really have to take care that uh, the land is not uh, 
uh, it's not sold to to other investors. Um, of course, we have uh, the um, we have a pressure for for much more uh, renewable energy. So we need more solar energy and more wind uh, energy, of course. But we have um, identified land that is um, uh, how do you call it? It is not as good as um, we have these. Uh, uh, Bodenpunkte, Stormy. Maybe you can you can help me. Um, you know, the, it, we have low quality land that uh, you can use for for building up energy um, uh, parks. Um, but uh, the agricultural land should be should be should be saved in in the hand of farmers. So, and um, now we have the discussion here in Saxony Anhalt of the um, we have to. Um, or we want to find an agricultural structure law that says uh, or that uh, brings more tra transparency into the uh, land market and um, that uh, avoids uh, concentration uh, that uh, that one owner has uh, uh, all all the land in one region so um, for now we we don't have a solution uh, for um, formulating this law but we are discussing it in parliament um, uh, and uh, we have a state company that uh, is allowed to buy land um, when there is an um, uh, when there is uh, someone who wants to buy land, and we don't know whether he really is farming on it. So we can uh, just uh, uh, control uh, land uh, cells. Uh, I hope you know what I, what I mean with it. So this is. Um, uh, how we can control uh, where owns land. Um, uh, and the next question is that we want to, um, as I said, that we want to avoid concentration. But uh, you probably know that we have in the new lender, we, we have um, the situation that we have these uh, big cooperative, cooperatives uh, that are working here. So they, they uh, own a lot of land uh, in, in, in the regions. Um, so they, we want, we don't want to destroy them. We want them um, that they can work further on. But um, you know, we have uh, those uh, startups or, or single farmers who are not getting, um, who cannot afford the land. So that's why we have to uh, uh, look that everybody can can buy land or rent land um, if he wants to and if he wants to um, uh, get into farming. This is a big question. Well, thank you so much. Um, we have two questions coming in in the uh, Q and A. Um, one is by Bettina Rudloff on trans also transatlantic trade agriculture conflicts, and we come back to that in a second. Um, the second one is by um, Anna Keeley. And she is asking about labor issues, um, and I would love to now also come to the issue of labor uh, to to labor uh, issues. Um, and we um, heard from Donna that it is really not that easy um, to um, get good labor, skilled labor for the agricultural sector, but also maybe unskilled labor. That migration laws are not always um, so helpful. And um, Anna is asking, what is the proportion of the unskilled and highly skilled workers? Um, employed in the in, in in agriculture, and what is the level of robotization, digitalization in the U.S. Um, and in EU farming? Um, and uh, maybe um, Russ, you can first come in, and then also Sydney, and then again Donna um, and Elbert. Sure. In the in the blueberry world, we're uh, you know we're working as hard as we can to get varieties that we can machine harvest. We have four machines on our farm. Um, we're we're not quite where we want to be yet, but but we hope that uh, that we'll be there in the next next five to ten years. Um, robotics are becoming more common in packing facilities. Um, you know, one of the problems that we've got in Georgia, and I'm, I'm I'm sure it's this way all across the country. In 2008, the workforce participation rate in the state of Georgia was 68 percent, and today it's 62 percent. And so Georgia has 10.7 million people. And so, you know, you take uh, close to you know, 700,000 people that were in the workforce in 2008 that aren't today, and it's creating issues. Um, we have issues with with uh, uh, trying to, to you know, use the H2A program. 
um, that's you know what we have to use to try to get our our crops harvested. Um, and then the prevailing wages, I, I forget our prevailing wage just went up to close to another two dollars. And um, you know we've got a we've got a bit of a uh, a blueprint of what's happened in the past. You know um, when NAFTA was enacted in 1994, there were 228 tomato farmers in the state of Florida. And today there's less than 20. And so that kind of stuff is concerning to me. Um, I don't, you know, I think what most farmers feel is we just want a level playing field. Uh, that's, that's what we really want. Because on a farm, especially a produce farm, you know, labor can be 40 or 50% of your cost. And if you're competing with someone who has a, a cost that's a tenth of what yours is in terms of, of labor, um, I don't know how they don't end up putting the farmer that whose whose labor cost is ten times as much out of business, and so I think that's the big issue with with us in in terms of labor is is um, you know how do we how do we make it fair to the American farmer, or do we are we going to just are we going to say that you know even if in states like Arizona there's a huge industry in Arizona right there at the border where the, where farmers are farming in Mexico. And then coming right across the border and and packaging uh, those products in the United States, um, and we have our own issues here as well. Whether you've got out in California, there are a lot of farmers that have gone down uh, into Mexico and that are farming. Um, the problem that it creates is the the produce industry has gotten to be huge uh, in in Mexico, and then you've got the Midwestern corn and soybean lobby, who obviously you know, exports are are a huge part of their success, and so it creates um, a little bit of a divide on, on, on what we want to see happen because they're worried about if we impose some kind of, and listen, I led an effort or was part of leading an effort where we we raised $2 million to carry a case in front of the International Trade Commission. I went up and testified in Washington. I mean, I've been working on this for a long time and, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm getting off subject here, but if there's one thing that I can say that most American farmers feel is that we we want a level playing field. On the flip side of that, we also um, we're we're dealing in a world today in terms of consolidation, where in the United the United States you now have four corporations that process 85 percent of the beef in this country. Um, you know that that's that's not a good thing for rural America, uh, and honestly, I don't think it's a good thing for food security. We saw that throughout COVID, where you know, it's the same thing with, with baby formula when we had uh, baby formula shortages in this country. And there are a lot of political stuff that got thrown out, thrown out about that. And, you know, I don't know if those two children that 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 passed away, if it came from that plan. I don't know if the FDA uh, you know, should have shut them down or if they they didn't get them or if they got them up going fast. enough. I don't know any of that. But I do know that the root cause of that problem is you now have three corporations that produce virtually all the baby formula that's consumed in the United States. And so that that's concerning to me for food security, what consolidation is, is doing. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, handing it over to Sydney and uh, throwing in another question which just came in, also on labor though. And um, Bettina is also asking um, if there are young people working um, in the farm sector, agricultural sector, and if there is a way, um, if there are any programs um, which try to, to attract young people to go into agriculture? That's um, a, a good question for me to speak to just because recently I have noticed how many young couples are farming in my community, in my area. And we do take a lot of tours around the state. And, and in Kansas, we are seeing more young people uh, in farming than I dreamed would, we would see. Now, I don't know what the numbers are, but to see them actually there uh, doing the work and uh, partly because the technology has allowed them um, to do a lot of the social things, um, communicate with people better. Uh, they, they don't feel so isolated perhaps, um, but, but they are going home to the farms. Uh, you know, the baby boomers are, are kicking off and uh, retiring and those kids have to come home or those farms will be corporate. Um, I, uh, it's interesting, um, after COVID, um, we saw a lot of change in uh, 
what was I, some point you made, Russ, I'm sorry, I, I've lost that thought, but uh, COVID did change how we do things. And uh, I, I think um, in many ways, it, it um, was just a turning point that was, was coming. And we're gonna see the changes in the future. Um, we have, I just toured a, lo a large farm in Western Kansas. They had uh, 26 people employed. I believe the acreage was 40,000 acres. They have four semi trucks, four tractors uh, with 12 foot wide equipment on the front that, that they have blades that they change from one thing to another to another to do the work. Uh, we're doing a lot of no-till farming too. I, I think that's uh, something that probably you're all doing, I don't know. Um, but with 26 people and in the room, uh, in the bunkhouse, basically, uh, was all the, the monitors and they were monitoring the fields constantly. Uh, they're sending drones out to see if fields are dry, if they're getting enough fertilizer. Uh, and their spot, doing mediation in spots instead of doing a whole field at one time to conserve water, energy, and, and um, cost. So I, I think the farming industry in Kansas has really stepped up and it's been pretty exciting. I was on a call with Sorrel, um, the international, do you know Sorrel? I'm not sure what it all stands for, but an international organization of farmers and I attend their conference occasionally and um, was on a board call the other day with them. Uh, they were concerned. Uh, one of the members was very concerned about cattle coming into the country from Canada, uh, flooding the market for beef up in his area. It must have been North, uh, North Dakota, I believe. But Anyway, so their people are, you know, we're fighting those same issues that Russ is saying, you know, the influx of, of goods. And yet without trade, where do we, you know, we don't, I um, was also on a call with former Ag Secretary Dan Glickman and former Ag Secretary from Nebraska. I can't remember his name. I remember the Kansas guy. Um, but they were talking about how we must not really cannot shut down our borders. We do need to trade. Um, so when when it starts to get, we're getting too many blueberries in in the south from Mexico and too many cattle in the, from the north. I don't know what the answer to that is. I I know we all want to keep food costs down. The United States has done a wonderful job of keeping food costs down. And my dad used to pour out milk because he wasn't getting the price he needed for milk. Uh, there were days. And, um, you know, so I understand that we need to pay for what we have. And I understand we need to trade with other countries and understand that it might not seem fair when you're competing. And the labor issue is a huge one. It hasn't been as much a problem in Kansas for farming, but right now everybody's looking for people to go to, to work with them. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about, uh, the land, uh, I believe is Donna or Elred, I'm not sure who was talking, I think it's Donna, but we do have, cons we have conservation easements uh, a lot of farming, uh, we have protected farms from um, wind or solar energy by doing, uh, the farms are going into conservation e easements. Uh, the governor uh, in 2003 uh, put a huge patch of land into a conservation area to protect from wind farms. So, um, it's just to protect our natural grass prairie. Government can do some things, but it's it's hard to figure out which things. I'm listening. Yeah, which things? Um, Donna, let me bring in you, um, because in your <laughs> labor issues were one of the big challenges you mentioned in the beginning. What can state legislators do about that? <laughs> 
a lot of different threads going on here. Let, let me uh, talk about a couple of things we're doing to attract young farmers. We just instituted, uh, or we're just putting more money behind uh, a bill that I, uh, I recently passed, creating a young farmers loan forgiveness program. So we're helping them, you know, to help with their college expenses. We also have a very um, successful program called Farmland for a New Generation. And we have um, a navigator, navigators throughout the state who are helping match uh, farmers who want to retire with new farmers. And it's, it's kind of like a dating program for people wanting to get into farming. But it's been very successful in creating these, in creating these matches. We're also finding, as far as new farmers, um, they're very interested in uh, some of the new commodity crops that we've uh, you know, recently seen spikes in, uh, hops. Uh, once we changed all our old prohibition era uh, beverage laws, uh, we have a lot more people wanting to grow for grain for spirits and hops for beer and, and getting into our, you know, our wine industry as well. Not to mention you know, the work we've done on industrial hemp and now with the legalization of cannabis. So there's a lot more interest in, in certain types of crops that are, are coming along. But I, I do find some hope in the Navigator program in, in really helping people you know, into you know, making those links. Uh, back on, on the labor issue, um, you had a question uh, about the wage mandates. In New York State, uh, several years ago, uh, against my objection, uh, it, we passed a bill requiring um, overtime be paid after 60 hours of work. Um, and that was recently just changed to uh, phase that into 40 hours. After 40 hours, uh, overtime would have to be paid uh, for, for workers. Um, and that would be phased in over the next 10 years, I believe. Um, I'm certainly supportive of, of, of the concept. It's just to take New York and it puts us at a regional disadvantage with all of the states that are surrounding us, not to mention all the pressures that Senator has talked about with costs. Um, so what the governor and my colleagues have done, and I helped negotiate this, is we're going to be paying the farmers the difference through a tax credit. Uh, how sustainable that is, is a mystery to me. Um, but it, it does seem like, uh, unless we overhaul uh, the way the whole system operates to, to adjust this one piece, makes things very uh, stressful for, for our farmers. So, you know, back to, you know, back to the young people, uh, I do see a, a, real, a, real, uh, a real interest developing. And to the point on uh, water, we have plenty of that in, in New York State. That's you know, the one thing, the one thing we don't have to worry about. <laughs> That's it, one thing. <laughs> yeah, no, thank, thank you so much. Um, I also um, looked up some numbers um, and I found that um, only 11% of all farms in the EU are run by farmers under the age of 40. Um, and in the United States, according to the census, it's only 9% of American farmers are aged um, 35 or younger. So um, there seems to be a big, big need um, to bring in, in young farmers. Um, I also want to bring in uh, Bettina, um, who wanted to talk a little bit about the transatlantic uh, trade conflicts. Um, and I want to bring her in via our audio. Um, Bettina, are you still there? Would you like to join us and ask um, your first question with regard to the conflicts? I can can you it. hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay, good evening to everybody. Hi, Stormy. We know each other. We were former colleagues. So uh, Bettina Rudloff, I'm working at the German Institute of International Security Affairs. I'm agriculture engineer and economist. So I used to work as well on a farm that was a nice obligation during the studying. Um, so my question is more, let's say, on the how to say, broader political issue. So thinking about the Russian aggressive war against Ukraine, and we all know what that meant uh, for the markets, especially on cereals. Um, here in Germany, and maybe as well in other European member states, there was a huge debate on we picked upon that a bit already, scarce land and what is the, let's say, ethical and maybe economical most sensible use of the scarce land. So the whole conflict between food, feed, fuel and ecological issues. And 
even in the EU, EU, there was a postponing of certain ecological relevant set aside programs saying, okay, now it's more important to use these area to, um, for production. So my question would be to the US colleagues, where do you see the most important conflicts regarding this issue with scarce land? What is the best use of this land? One step further, a very sensible issue I know for the US is the agri agrofuel issue. And the other question during G7, where Germany was the lead and US was part as well, there was a huge debate about, ah, oh, could we at least for it, for a limited time period, limit the agrofuel use. So not to use, in the US case, mice for fuel, um, but instead to use uh, the land for food. And there could be in the future other price crisis where that could be relevant, a flexible adjustment measure. And the US is one of the largest uh, producer of agrofuel based on mice or on corn. So. Um, I know it's sensible. My question is, do you see there, or where are the m major hindering factors? One could do a kind of cooperative issue between the EU and the US in terms, in times of crisis situations, we kind of a serious NATO, we uh, postpone the use of land for fuel in order to relax markets, in order to support international food security. Where do you see the major hindering factors in the US for that? I know it's tricky. Thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a, it's a huge question. Um, yeah, in, it's a little uh, huge. Yeah. Um, um, who wants to come in first on that one? <laughs> may, I, may I ask what is, what is, what is Scar's land? Yeah. Um, no, I think I think um, what Bettina meant uh, to say is that land is a resource which is endless. I mean, you don't have, oh. you know, scarce, it's scarce, scarce, scarce land. Scarce, scarce land. Um, it's, it's a scarce resource, so to say. And you can either grow, I mean, grow crops for food, or you can also grow grow crops for energy production. And um, if there is a shortage of food and prices are going up for food, um, and at the same time, especially here in Germany, prices for energy is also going up and we have um, a problem with uh, heating now in the winter, what should we do? Um, should we produce for energy production or should we produce for food production? How can we reconcile this? Donna, do you want to start? <laughs> no, I'm not. It, look, you know, the, you, she's hitting on, on, you know, sort of the the million dollar question. And you know, for those of us who are, you know, just working it out day by day, it's always we're always trying to do this big dance of this balance. Um, you know, um, I, I don't ha haven't had the luxury of stepping back and. Sort of looking at the global picture, which is one of the reasons I was intrigued by enjoying this conversation, so that New York State and the, and the rest of the states can view ourselves more in the global more in the global picture. Um, I, I find myself getting mired in in just these micro land uh, battles, but we we haven't really uh, gotten uh, so tied up on agrofuel because we don't we're not really producing a lot of that here here in, in New York State. Um, and as far as the scarcity of land, we 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 just have an enormous amount of land that has it has been underutilized. We've had so many farms go out of business that our goal has been trying to get them back online. Um, the tension that I'm finding is that farmers are choosing, you know, to turn over their land uh, to energy projects, which is why I'm intrigued about the approach in Germany, where. Um, where it was you know, stated earlier, well, we're just protecting our agricultural lands or trying to come up with a system of prioritizing uh, what we call prime farmland to you know, scrub land or a land that you know, would be better used for these purposes. So you know, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm, I'm working on is trying to come up with a balance, but also opening our lens a little bit to see how we, you know, our policies can better align with uh, the rest of the country and in the world. Hmm. Russ, you looked like that you were thinking about it very intensely. 
Well, yes, ma'am. I, we don't in, in Georgia. We, you know, one of the things we do is is we, uh, in my district here in Georgia, actually, we have a, a pellet plant where we cut pine trees. And well, it used to be when they, when they first started out, actually, they were taking about three hundred loads a day of what we call roundwood, you know, uh, logs or you know whole trees, and they were making pellets. Uh, we ship them to Savannah. They go on a barge and go to Europe for uh, uh, wood pellets for for heat, you know. Um, and now uh, they're not taking much uh, round wood at all. They're they're using uh, really the the leftovers, if you want to call it that, uh, the byproducts of uh, of the timber industry, the the chips and the the bark and all that to make these. Um, you know, in in terms of of using one of the things and with solar, I would like to see. I am concerned about this this farmland uh, being converted to solar and. Uh, you know, so y'all pardon me, and I, I know that, that farmers can complain a lot, and so, and I, I'm a seventh generation farmer, so obviously I'm pretty good at complaining, but um, when you look at at, uh, at farming in general, um, you know, I've got two sons. I've got a son that's a freshman at the University of Georgia that's majoring in ag economics, just like I did, and, um, you know, are they going to come home? The average age of a farmer is uh, 60 years old now, um, and the truth of the matter is for those that don't farm, you know, we could sell our farm and pay off what we owe and pay the capital gains taxes on it. And if we could take the remainder and put it in something making four or five percent interest, we would make more money um, watching television than we do actually trying to farm and trying to feed the American people. That's the, that's the, and you can talk to a lot of uh, any American farmer. They'll they'll tell you the same thing. And so that that's one of the things that I think in order to get people interested in coming back to the farm, you've got to change that dynamic because farming is a hard life. It's a rewarding life, but it's a hard life. Um, but in terms of you know ethanol use and and corn and all that, I I, I don't know the history behind that, and I know that that there's a, a there's a huge effort in the United States to protect the ethanol industry. Um, you know, I question sometimes if we couldn't do the same thing with switch grass and and other things to 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 be able to make 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 ethanol. I'm certainly no expert on. I know that in the United States we've got people that are taking switch grass and using it to to create uh, packaging um, and things like that. But uh, what, as far as scarce land, we've got, a, in Georgia, we've got a lot of land that's in timber production that could be converted uh, to farmland. And, and I don't know sometimes if we wouldn't be well served in our state, where if someone's gonna put in a 2000 acre solar farm that they've got to go somewhere and take, either mandate them that they, that they, that they clear up timberland uh, and, and put it on, Put those solar panels on timberland, or if they're going to put it on farmland, they've got to convert whatever acres they take out of agricultural production. They've got to go somewhere and buy timberland and put it in agricultural production. That's uh, because at the bottom, in, at the end of the day, the yield curve is not keeping up with the population curve. And so, if we're going to feed the world, we, we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to have more land in farming, and we certainly don't need to be taking land out of farming. You know. Mm -hmm. No, um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing um, uh, with us um, your experience, um, Elred, Maybe the discussion about f food versus fuel, or tank versus plate, tank versus teller, is a little bit more intensive um, in Germany than in the United States. Yes. yes, it seems so. It seems so. You know, the first idea when Russia invaded Ukraine. The first idea we had was, oh my God, the, all the wheat that uh, should be uh, exported from Ukraine, uh, Ukraine to the rest of the world, uh, we, we don't have it, uh, so it, it will not be exported this year. So all the other countries should substitute it. Um, this was our idea then to say, okay, and now we have to um, uh, prior, prioritize and say uh, food and not tank. But uh, on the other side, we have this: we have to switch to renewable energy energies. And I personally think that um, the biogas plants we have in Germany, they belong to the energy mixture we want as well. So, um, and we have to look at um, what we are feeding those biogas plants. You know, we um, a lot of uh, people who have uh, animals on their farm, they put the slurry into the biogas plants. Um, what I think is, is, is okay. And, and what's coming out of them, we uh, 
put as fertilizers into the farming um, again. So it's a, uh, it's a circle we, in, in what we produce um, uh, or in what we have our resources now. Uh, that's why we, we should uh, discuss um, um, how much uh, green plants belong into biogas plants and um, how much other products from farming as well. But I have a question as well, because it's, um, uh, uh, that's connected with what we are just uh, discussing. Uh, in Germany, we have uh, this uh, dualism between organic farming and conventional farming. And you know, our federal government wants to have 30% of, uh, of all farming should be organic farming in the future. So the conventional farmers should switch to organic way of farming, um, uh, or we, we, have to just, we have to have more organic farmers um, in this competition. But we also say that uh, the, the earnings out of that, uh, the harvest is not as much as we can reach from conventional farming. And so uh, this belongs to this discussion as well, how much food is needed in future to feed um, uh, the world. Uh, that's why I, I would like to ask you um, uh, whether this discussion you have as well in America, in the United States, um, uh, between organic and conventional, and uh, we sometimes we say the conventional farming is not healthy enough. That's why we have to switch, uh, or all this um, uh, what what we connotate with with it. Um, you know, it's it's a really it's it's a hard discussion, and um, I I really. I don't want to discuss about it any longer because I say all the conventional farmers have um, the potential to be environment friendly as well. They can uh, just uh, put environmental practices uh, or for, for climate um, uh, friendly practices as well, as well. That's why I just don't want to uh, speak any longer about the two ways of forming, but um, it's, it's going on here. So um, uh, what's, what about you? That's the best part of a conversation when the moderator becomes uh, uh, unnecessary anymore and um, you engage <laughs> in a discussion among yourselves. <laughs> Who wants to jump in? Yeah, we, we don't have any mandates. Uh, we're certainly encouraging people who want to transition to organic farming. We support our, our organic farmers organization. I just provided them with funding to streamline their certification process to help on our web their web platforms. But we, we would certainly, I, I don't think I would be able to get away with putting down a percentage goal uh, at, at any stretch. Again, our New York farmers, you know, they, they want to be provided with information, the opportunities, the resources, but and then they'll, they'll, they'll go from there. Um, I certainly understand the value of it. Um, the focus that we also have at uh, Cornell's research labs on precision agriculture, I think is going a long way to, to, you know, to reducing the usage of certain chemicals that people find objectionable on crops. Uh, so that's a, a pretty exciting development, in my view, the, the precision or the digital agriculture, as you might call it. Do you want to comment on that one? Well, I would say, uh... Uh, w organic farming is, um, well, organic foods are quite the rage. Um, and I personally can't tell the difference. So I would have a hard time with that. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, if it's to use less fertilizer, if it's to keep the water cleaner, if there's some reasons that, um, like you say, the environmentally friendly things can, can still occur. One of the things we did recently, and I thought little of it as we did it through committee, but uh, we do have um, a cleanup plan that the state participates in the cleanup of spilled fertilizer that's out in fields and um, where people, I mean, it seemed a little thing to me, but I have a little farm. So I don't know how big a thing it really was, but to, to get, um, to clean up the fertilizer that's been spilled or left behind in fields uh, is a pretty big thing, I guess, especially where water um, goes in. So that's one of the things that we've been doing. And it's that kind of thing that makes organic farming attractive, I guess. Um, 
I can't, I just, but we also are working on, um, uh, and I was sick and didn't go to this lecture, but uh, they're trying to t take methane from the, from the farms, the, the beef uh, pens, stockyards, they used to call them, um, taking that and processing it for fuel. Uh, we thought about using it for energy when we were um, trying to uh, deny the coal plant uh, to be built and um, it wasn't ready. We weren't ready, the science wasn't ready, but we're working on that as a, a way to uh, get more water, separate the water, use the methane for fertilizer clean up the fields, clean up the stockyards. Um, yeah, I'm, not I'm impressed by this group and what we're sharing. And I was listening to Russ talk about clearing timber and yeah. my brother was a forester. He passed away a couple years ago, but he was internationally known for going into forest areas. He spent a lot of time in Germany actually um, and South America and he said, I am one person. Everybody talks about um, trying to, to uh, save the rainforest. And he said, I'm someone who can do that. And he went to Pakistan and with the USAID project and they planted millions of eucalyptus trees for five years. And after five years, they could cut those from the, the, at the bottom and they would grow back to reforest a country that has no wood they had no wood for fuel, they had no wood for housing, no wood for anything. And sociologically, he worked with seven tri 70 tribes to keep them from letting their people cut that down. So, you know, when you talk about clearing for farming, yes, Georgia has a lot of trees. We don't have those in Kansas, but um, we have to watch. There's a hydrological cycle there that we have to protect as well. So I understand, and it is opening my eyes to see um, all of our different points of view and needs as we see them from our communities, and I really appreciate being a part of it. Thank you. I think there's so much to learn from each other. Um, we are almost at the end. Um, time went really, really fast. Russ, there was a very nice question, though, to you um, by Katja Griesen, and she asked you, because you were just in Germany, and if there was something which surprised you um, on your visit here um, and which you learned and took away home with. And I want to close off our whole discussion with another question to all of you again. And this is the one thing you would recommend your um, counterparts on the other side of the Atlantic to look at, something to learn from you. Um, what would you recommend? But let me first start with Russ. Um, asking you what was surprising. Well, it was an amazing trip. And I will tell you, uh, Robin can tell you, uh, she she was the person that that uh, we really got to be good friends. And she's a great human being. And uh, she, as, uh, as she says, I met a lot of cousins up there because my, my last has been Americanized. It's Goodman now, but 400 years ago, it was Gutmann. And my family was from the Rhineland of Germany. So uh, I'll joke, I've, I had a lot of cousins over there. Um, I want to say one quick thing about organic, and there's one thing I think there's a misconception a little bit about organic, and we've looked at, at going to organic. Uh, one of the problems is, is, is are the American people willing to pay the increase in price to justify the cost? But also, um, a lot of times people think if something's grown organically that it's not sprayed with pesticides. That's, that's not the case. It's just mm -hmm. it's yeah. sprayed with uh, certified organic pesticides. So that's... A lot, some folks don't realize that, but I think one of the things that I came away from, first off, the German people are amazing people, kind, um, you know, just great people and they welcomed us. And, um, but I think one of the things that I came away with is the fact that Germany really doesn't have an energy sector within their borders as far as having the ability to, to get their own oil and, and, and natural gas and that kind of thing. And so it was amazing to me what you all were doing um, and obviously with the war in Ukraine, it's, it's, it's created, um, it's not a, I mean, honestly, I, it's not a good situation for you, for your country. I, I, I and I, I feel for you because, you know, it just so happens that in America, we, 
we happened to get a patch of dirt that had a lot of natural gas and we've got oil and you know and so the way that you're using we went to one village where the, you know the way you were mining your manure from your farms uh with from your hogs and cows and using that uh to make methane gas and we actually mm -hmm. saw for it for those of y'all that were on the trip this is amazing but they're uh and in Georgia, we, we have our cows in pastures. There they have them in buildings and um, they, they do that so they can capture uh, the manure. And they're using that manure to make methane gas. The methane gas is going to engines that are running 24 hours a day, 365 days a, a year. They have generators hooked to them. And this one village we were at, those two engines from poop basically were supplying electricity to 120 homes and they were capturing the exhaust from the engines and using the exhaust heat to be able to heat the homes and to heat the water. Now, my curiosity about that is, is economically, how does that work out in terms of at the end of the, of the day? I know that with what you all are doing, um, what you're faced with in terms, especially with the war in Ukraine, um, but that was something that re was really a amazing to me of, of what you all are doing. I think you all do a better job of diversifying your farms. I mean, every farm I went to had hogs and cows. And I, I will say this, I've told people since I got home, if we had an EMP device detonated over the United States and one was detonated over Germany, the German people would fare better than the American people would because you're, you've made a conscientious effort to have a more diversified portfolio on each farm in terms of those communities. And we have allowed ourselves to become more consolidated. And so that was something that impressed me as well. One of the things that I like that you all do as well is if you're going to buy farmland, you've got to be a farmer. And that's something that farmers are dealing with in this country where we're having these investment firms that are coming in and buying up these big swaths of farmland and it's pricing it out for uh, for farmers. Um, it, it's uh, it's making it difficult to obtain land and it, the barriers to entry in agriculture today are worse than they've ever been. Um, so I, I can get long-winded and I'll stop now, but I would just say this, I'm really honored to have been able to be on that trip. I'm, I'm thankful for the friends that we made. Um, you know, we have so much in common. Uh, you know, we uh, I, I look forward to our friends coming to Georgia next year and hosting them. And uh, it was one of the most rewarding trips I've ever been on in my life. So I really appreciate the American Council on Germany for allowing me to go and for the friendships that I made. Wow, thank you so much. Um, those were almost last words, but not quite, because I also want to ask uh, Sydney, Elred and uh, Donna, what would be good lessons learned for the other side or good recommendations? Well, first of all, I'd like to get involved with those trips. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Georgia, Germany. Um, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to add something all that um, profound at this point. I can just tell you that I have learned since the pandemic that the food food is, is you know, a great equalizer in many ways. Uh, I was able to use the pandemic to help educate my um uh, colleagues in the more er, um, New York City and, and those uh, areas about the need to become more aware and sympathetic to our, our farmers upstate. It was the surplus food that we purchased from upstate and sent to our downstate food pantries that really began to open people's eyes uh, at the value of what we're doing in our agricultural sector. So I think in, in general, uh, I find that um, food and also the commodities that you know, produce uh, different products that people enjoy is a, is a way to bridge, build bridges, not only between sectors of the state, but among different states and, and other countries. So um, that that's sort of my, uh, my feeling on that. Thank you so much. Um, and Sydney? Well, I wish I, I had had the trip to Germany. Um, I did uh, <clears throat> take a couple of trips with uh, groups to Azerbaijan and Turkey. And I really was interested in the farming uh, and the production of, of their food. Um, but I don't know what, what's happening really other than what you've told us today in uh, Germany. Um, I don't know if we could help you with drip irrigation technology. Um, are you doing no-till farming? Are you planting the, the root crops and the cover crops? Um, um, Kansas State University is in my district, and it's a huge agricultural research facility. Um, and 
Uh, we have a grain science program that uh, brings people into our country and they study with us and, and learn about foods and stuff. I'm sure that there's something you could learn from us, but I know you're very advanced in, in research and, and all of your production seems very upscale. Um, I also would just put in a note that uh, Kansas State University just completed the uh, building of the National Bioagra Defense Facility, which is going to replace Plum Island um, facility for research for uh, zoonotic diseases. And um, so that is a New York thing. Uh, we're trading with uh, New York, um, bringing the research to Kansas um, was quite an interesting um, controversy. For, and we started working on this in 1996. So it's been a long time coming. The, the facility has been built and we're in the commissioning process now. But we're going to study um, plant and animal diseases. Um, and uh, our, really our thrust right now has been food security and water security from outside threats and outside diseases. So um, I hope that some of you will come and study at Kansas State. And uh, I'd love to come to visit your country. Thank you very much for having me. Thank Stay you so much. And last but not least, um, Elred. Yeah, well, um, I, what I would recommend uh, is what uh, Russ said earlier, you know, um, maybe the biomethane uh, production in, in large parts uh, pub publi publicly funded, of course, but this you could uh, have a look at, or maybe the crop insurance for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We covered so many issues and only very superficially, and we need to dig a lot deeper. So this is the start of a conversation, I think, and not the end. There were more questions, I mean, more specific questions in the Q&A also asking about certification for for, for organic uh, produce, um, many more issues, but um, we can't cover them all today. But um, we will continue working on agricultural issues, um, both at the Aspen Institute um, and um, at ACG. But Russ, you wanted to come in? I just wanted to say one thing. It was a pretty profound quote from my friend Lars, who is a German farmer. And I, I'll never forget it, but I shared it with you all there on the, on the screen. He said, uh, a man who is hungry has one problem. A man who is not hungry has many problems. <laughs> and uh, I thought that was very profound and I will never forget that. I thought y'all would like to hear that. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so very much. Um, and last but not least, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, we also at, at, at German as um, at the German Aspen Institute, we are just starting with our future forum farming initiative. And the first ye uh, year is going to focus on uh, Brandenburg, Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, um, Sachsen, and in the US side on the whole Midwest. And farmers can still, and ranchers can still apply for this as well. So if you know anybody who would like to participate, um, send them over to us. Um, we would love to have them. And um, we are going to post um, a link in the chat um, in a second and also send it, send it around. So applica the application process is still open. But let me thank you once again very, very much um, for taking the time being here today, um, sharing your insights with us, um, sharing what the challenges are, of which there are many, but also sharing um, best practices and solutions with us. Um, and we hope to continue the conversation. And the link to our project has been just uh, posted in the Q&A. Um, so thank you once again. And I would last but not least, I would hand, uh, like to hand back to, um, uh, to Rob from um, ACG. I didn't realize I was going to be on the screen again. Oh, uh, sorry, but I thought you were also- No wanted problem. To um, I guess, uh, again, I'll just extend a, a Great big thanks to all of you from the American Council on Germany. Really appreciate, again, you all taking the time to join us today. And uh, we will follow up with all of you. We, this was a great conversation, and I hope we were able to build some connections between all of you, and, and we'll continue to facilitate that in the future.
whether it's with the ATG or with the Aspen Institute of Germany. So thank you everybody for a wonderful yes. conversation. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good day. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye.